welcome back to another episode of Old Movies Save My Life. Some people have asked me, Mel, why is this show called Old Movies Saved My Life? Well, in order to find out the true answer to that, you'll have to come and see my upcoming show. Did I mention that? It will be at the Edinburgh Fringe uh, from the 2nd to the 25th of August at the Space at Jury's Inn. Nothing like getting a quick advert in right at the beginning. There will be some other London previews as well, so uh, do check me out at The Mel Byron. For those of you who can't get to see it, let me just summarise it by saying it's about a little girl who grew up in a hick town, barefoot, starving, uneducated, but managed to put together a semblance of life based on her love of old movies. Some of that is actually true. Some of it isn't. The only way you're going to find out is by coming to see my show. In the meantime, let's have a podcast, hey? This week, I met with my friend Louise Atkinson, also comedian, and uh, I'm happy to say old movie lover. Uh, we sat down together and watched the 1953 Vincent Minnelli classic, The Bandwagon. Hope you all enjoy this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. So it's over to me and Louise sitting at my dining table on a random Saturday afternoon not so long ago. And welcome, Louise. Hi. Hi. <laughs> you said that in a lovely kind of jaunty American <laughs> fashion. Well, Louise, we watched uh, The Bandwagon. Yes, we did. From 1953. Did you enjoy it, first I of all? I did enjoy it. I excellent. thought it was excellent. Good. Oh, well, that makes me very happy because I'm always worried. You know, you know when you'd like, you, even when you take someone to the theatre or something and you don't know they're going to like it. Um, uh, at least you... there's ice cream at the interval. <laughs> yes, exactly. There's no such reward here. <laughs> the only reward you have is doing this podcast. <laughs> so, good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, so, The Bandwagon, it's a musical from 1953 for the benefit of people who haven't seen it. The reason why I we ended up choosing this was because when we first discussed this mm. you said you loved singing in the rain i do love singing in the rain yeah which mm. i get it's a marvelous <laughs> film not, but i said i love the bandwagon more and you were shocked yeah and then it turned out you hadn't actually seen the bandwagon <laughs> so i thought well we better rectify that straight yeah, to, away. to be fair that was bad of me to go like, how could you not like singing in the rain compared to this other film i have never seen uh just the audacity of such a claim <laughs> i mean i get it though because singing in the rain is a classic everybody knows singing in the rain not everybody knows the bandwagon fair, yeah. fair enough um i love the bandwagon partly because i adore fred astaire and yeah. i like him better than gene kelly which is fair but i just think it's just a wonderful film the dancing in it just the music is fabulous lots of people everybody knows the song that's entertainment and even if you know that most people don't know that that's the film that the bandwagon is the film it came from that is true yeah but the bit that confused me though was obviously they were trying to put on a play and they did it first mm -hmm. and it went wrong then they did it again and it was successful. Grand. Brilliant. <laughs> However, having looked at the scenes <laughs> of what they were putting on, what on earth was that play about? There was an opening number, right? Crack on, got that. Then something about triplets. Then we went down to a hayride with some very redneck people. And then we had a murder mystery jazz fest in Chicago or New York or wherever it was, where there was some woman who just appeared and straped her leg all over Fred Astaire. And you went, this girl looks like trouble. Well, she looks like she's in trouble, Fred. She's just done the splits across your body. And beautifully done. And I oh, wonderfully done. I don't discredit that. But I was like, why is this why is play? That's <laughs> very interesting you say that. Because... Um, um, the other week, um, I interviewed uh, this Anna Friedman, and we looked at we watched Forty Second Street, which is also a backstage <laughs> musical about a play, and we couldn't find <laughs> what that one was about either. So wait a minute, she shuffled off to Buffalo, but with a different bloke that she seems to be with at the end. And why are they all, oh, yeah. why are they all holding up Empire State Buildings? Because <laughs> to be fair, I think that happens in White Christmas. I think that happens as well. Because at the end they have a big Christmassy number, but then in the middle there's like a minstrel show <laughs> and some other bits. It's like, what's going on here then, lads? <laughs> 
Do you know what? I think it doesn't matter. I think that's the whole point, is it actually doesn't matter. So just for the benefit of of the listeners, so the plot of the bandwagon, the film, is Fred Astaire is a slightly washed up Hollywood star Mm -hmm. who's come back to New York to star in a show and his friends have written this show and they've got on board the most egotistical (laughs) producer-director in the history of the world who's managed to change their show to a modern version of Faust. It's a failure. Fred takes over and says, don't worry, we'll turn this into a show. And yeah, it's full of these songs and we have no idea why. (laughs) Although right at the beginning, his friends, if you remember, they say that the story is about a children's book writer who on the side (laughs) writes murder mysteries. Mm. And I think the children's book bit is where the triplets thing comes in. Because if you see the background, it's all sort of little cartoony drawings. So I think that's where... I I mean, I'm making this up. I'll I'll go with that. All right, yeah. (laughs) And then at the end, the girl hunt. That is one of the that's one of his uh, murder mystery things mm, that he's right. written. Although the the murder mystery bit at the end, the girl hunt, I can't even understand the plot. Of that. <laughs> <laughs> there's a blonde woman, and and then there's a dark haired woman. There's a uh, lot of cartwheels, and there's a lot of people <laughs> cartwheeling around Forty Second Street yeah. <laughs> station, subway station, then shooting each other. I have no idea what's it going on. It didn't look like that in Fast and Furious, did it? <laughs> I have oh, to them confess. Oh, car- then cartwheeling, shooting people. Rock um, Mr. Trick there, didn't he? Oh, not um, the Rock Vin Diesel. Generic bald man, I guess I'm confused. You see, here's where we differ, Louis. <laughs> You're actually watching the modern films. <laughs> the talkies. The to- <laughs> yes, and I'm not. If it was made after 1960... No! <laughs> Why would I? Why would I? Nothing, surely nothing in Fast and Furious gives you the joy that we've just Oh no, watched. you're 100% correct. Other than Vin Diesel, nothing gives me the joy in Fast and the Furious. But like, does that mean then that, because I quite like all the old black and white sci-fi movies as well, but I also like all the modern sci-fi, like I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Does this mean you're like, that oh, was made in 1970, whatever, it's a no from me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a deadline, it's done. <laughs> basically, yes. Basically, as far as movies are concerned, if I was alive when it, when it was made, <laughs> it's probably a no. That's not entirely fair, but honestly, after about 1960, I think films kind of lost their charm, really. Yeah. And, you know, once Doris Day had really knocked it all on the head, and she yeah. was making films into the mid-late mid, 60s. Yeah, really, after the mid, mid-60s. mid I'm really stretching it now, mid-60s. <laughs> That's what I'm going for. Mid-60s, which is um, you know, when I was born. Uh, <laughs> then it's, it's over for me. Um, does that mean you didn't... Choose my words carefully. Oh, I'll be nice. Did that mean you didn't watch La La Land? I didn't watch it. I I, I almost watched it on a plane last <laughs> year, watch and I it. and I couldn't bring myself to do it. I know, yeah. I know. That's so. I did watch The Artist, which that is was almost, good. and that was good, and that did for me, you know, capture mm. that era. And uh, well, this is controversial to say based on how amazing everybody thought it was, but I couldn't stand it personally, and I was really, really excited because I love. I do love old movies, but I particularly love old musicals. And I feel that they were just, like you said, they were so well done. And the the fact that there was just always someone catered for, there was the one who could dance but couldn't act or sing, the one that could sing but was like, I'm not doing anything else. And then the one that could do all three, which didn't actually ever get anywhere, usually because they were the gay one and they couldn't (laughs) progress. And, you know, but they were all good at what Mm. they, they were not good, they were excellent at what they did. Whereas La La Land, I will admit, I thought the original score was quite good. But it seemed to me, uh, two actors have a go and they would kind of have a bit of a dance and they would kind of sing a bit. And it was okay. It, it felt a little bit like I'd gone to see a friend in a village school theatre thing and I'd be like, oh, you did great, Emma. <laughs> and like, yeah, it was not because amazing. It's, mm. But that's... It, What's the point of a musical where it isn't amazing? Exactly. Where, where the spectacle isn't great. I mean, if Fred Astaire could roughly dance a bit and Sid Charisse, you know, she could do, you know, a little bit of leg kicking <laughs> and the songs were all right, would we even... Ju- no, no, exactly. the whole point of that film was that it was... Per- the whole point of certainly the bandwagon, but any of the musicals I, that I've watched and I liked, unless it's perfect and... 
Perfection doesn't necessarily mean that you understand the plot. <laughs> but, just means an earlobe kick. That's yeah. what it means. It's just it's, the songs come in and they're beautiful and everything is beautifully done. And I don't know why Fred Astaire and Jack Buchanan did that <laughs> duet with the top hats and the canes. <laughs> other than I guess it was a reference to the fact that they were both in the 1930s, the great musical stars of mm. those top hat and cane kind of musicals. But it was great. It was great. And for people who love those kinds of music, the idea of those two people doing that song together, because mm. they are both the best at what they do, not two blokes having a go at being <laughs> like Fred Astaire and Jack Buchanan. Yeah. What would be the point of that? I'm I don't with understand. You. And, and mm. so I literally, I was on a plane and I was going to watch La La Land and I thought, no, I can't. I can't do it. And I wasn't sure that the screen would give me what I, you know, the screen on the back of a somebody's seat. But no, to me, that's not what the Hollywood musical's about. For me, it's just the sheer joy, the, the sheer fluffiness of the plots that are, frankly, nonsensical most <laughs> of the time. And, and like most films in the musicals, if they just had a little bit of communication... <laughs> have, you, have you ever seen Top Hat? Yes. Top, the whole of Top Hat, the whole plot is because Ginger Rogers doesn't realise that Fred Astaire isn't married to her friend. Whereas if he just said, oh, no, 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 you've got me confused with somebody else... There would have been no and that problem. film was ten minutes, guys. Yeah, <laughs> Wrap yeah, it up. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, but hey, why would they have done that? Because then we wouldn't have had ninety minutes of sheer and utter joy that's very true. made by people at the top of their profession. And at least that's only ninety minutes. I mean, Shakespeare did it for many moons, and all of his plays were about five days long, where he misunderstood <laughs> someone for some. Oh well, they're pretending to be dead, and then there's another four acts to come. You know, at least this is only ninety minutes. I, I still contend that if King Lear, if <laughs> Cordelia, if Cordelia had just said, "No, Dad," what I meant was. We could have wrapped it up in 10 minutes. Nobody would have died. Nobody's eyes would have been gouged out, which is hot, worse than death itself, I think. And everything would have been fine. Yeah. And King Lear would have just ended up in an old people's home. <laughs> it would have been fine. Well, yeah, because the modern day clarity, which is good, which you don't get in the old films, is a load of millennials screenshotting WhatsApp conversations going, look, it did happen. <laughs> so it's like, oh... That is quite clear. Yes. yes thanks for <laughs> There's that. There's no misunderstanding yeah, there. Yeah, because heaven forbid we should have some poor communication. <laughs> but honestly, I, I this is one of my, my contentions in my show, is that poor communication has really made a lot of films. Uh, there's a great film that I love called Four Daughters, and in it, one of them marries a really feckless individual. Shocker. It's sho <laughs> I know, shocker. Uh, and he's a nice bloke, but he's a bit feckless. And he realises that they shouldn't have got married. So his conclusion, his solution to, well, I guess a quick divorce, is he just drives, drives his car off a cliff. Eh? He could have just said, love, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> Um, and that would have been an end to it. And then and then she could have married the man she really loved. And she would still have had a car. <laughs> <laughs> Which are expensive. Yeah. Car, no claims bonus. <laughs> um, and even in the bandwagon, you, you just felt like, just tell her you love her. And she, honestly, she'll dump the boyfriend. She will. She will, won't she? she was, Obviously, She yeah. was going to dump the boyfriend. Although he was rather good looking, I have to I, say. I thought he was quite a dish. He and Fred Astaire... <laughs> Was a bit older in this one. Yeah, he was, I think he was 53. So he would have been, yeah, in his early to mid 50s. And by she this was one. in her 20s. 20 something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, again, bit of a plot. Oh, well, actually, I'm, I was about to say a bit of a plot hole, but no, actually, no, there's quite a lot of people that do that because they're like, oh, here's this successful guy with money. Ooh. Yeah. Um, and as we saw, he had a room full of Degas, exactly. Bobby, Bobby, sure Bobby, Bobby, Yeah, clearly. Um, uh, and he was a big famous star, even though his star might have been slightly on the way. But yeah, the boyfriend. Poor. Yeah. And he was a beautiful he dancer. Wasn't beautiful. You know, there's always those bit part ones, and they usually are like the choreographer or they're the main dancer, but they get no credit because if they open their mouth, they sound horrendous. Yeah. Do you think now they desperately cling on to that, like I would, and they just show anyone who ever comes to their proximity? So, like, for example, uh, if someone came to their door, it'd be like, oh, no, I'm terribly sorry, I'm not interested in double blazing, but you want to see this film I was in in the 1940s, which I would do to... In fact, I would get... You had your big projector thing here. I would put that at the front of my house and I would just have it, especially if I looked like them and could dance like them, I would just yeah. have it playing on a loop. Do you know, it's my dream that, that some... That 
some old person who lives on my street <laughs> turns out to have been a huge film star and wants to show me all the albums of their cutting. <laughs> it is my dream. That this they just lo- tap dance down the road. Yes! My morning! <laughs> yes! And it turns out that I do actually live down the road from Fred Astaire. I mean, obviously, Fred died a, <laughs> a lot of years ago. So when people refer to things as modern day classics, would you instantly one be highly dubious just automatically and to normally have an idea in your head that you're not going to like it i think i probably would go in for the i would definitely go in for the i'm prejudiced it won't be as good as such and such a film that i love i mean i did once on a plane watch dog day afternoon which was made in 1975 i think because i had never watched it and i knew that era was something that wasn't in my sort of vocabulary. And I watched it and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a really good film. Now I was a captive audience at 30,000 feet, (laughs) but I did really enjoy it. If it came on the telly, would I watch it? Probably not. I mean, I've never seen Taxi Driver, for example. It's Uh, a good film, though. It's like that and um, Thelma and Louise. So I've never seen that either. But I I think it's brilliant. It's excellent. I mean, there are modern films that I've watched that I really, really love... (laughs) <laughs> whilst drunk and I don't remember them <laughs> I hated Titanic are you allowed to say that yeah I I mean you're only like half hour in and the boat's already started you just yeah. started sinking and there's another three hours of the film to go and you're like, oh blimey <laughs> I know I know and that woman two people could have fit on that door <laughs> as we all know that's <laughs> been scientifically proven it's been Ridiculous. scientific the only reason for me to watch Titanic was right at the beginning to watch the old lady who's played by Gloria Stewart who was in a lot of Universal horror films in the 1930s. So to see this great star, but once she's not in it, why would I watch it? I mean, I do get a different enjoyment from it because I make a lot of gifts, as you know, and it is incredible for those. Like, the old woman at the beginning is one of the most famous gifts now where you can say anything in terms of, oh, January lasted long, didn't it? How long did it last? And then there's the gif of her going, it's been 84 years, and it just is so applicable to everything. And then there's another one that I made where there's a... Because <laughs> it's obviously in the 1900... Well, it's 1912, isn't it? Because that's when Titanic was. It's in the 1900s sometime. That's when Titanic was. Great history to try have. <laughs> but uh, there's one bit where there's a... Uh, Rose is asking something about the Titanic and she gets it wrong because she's not an engineer, basically. And some bloke just comes by and he goes women and machinery and then it just goes off and every time I have to use PowerPoint at work and it doesn't go well all I can think in my head is that bloke going women and machinery so I do like Titanic for that but the actual enjoyment and watching of it less so so a great source for gifts (laughs) but actually as a movie Pretty lacking. Pretty lacking. Pretty yeah. lacking. Of course, there is the 1953 film about the... Well, there's two, aren't there, 50 films? There's Titanic with Barbara Stanwyck. Yeah. And then, of course, there's A Night to Remember with Kenneth Moore, which was made, I, I think, also one. in 1952, mm-hmm. I think. Somebody's going to correct me on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is based on a book written by the officer that he plays, Officer yeah. Lightoller, who survived and helped people, other people survive. But I always think that's very funny because it's called A Night to Remember, <laughs> which is such a British understatement, <laughs> isn't it? Oh, that was a night to remember <laughs> when thousands of people perished in the yeah. cold. And that winter. night on the lifeboat, Ethel, it was <laughs> lovely. It was a night to remember. Oh dear, we've moved very far from the van Sorry, bandwagon. That was my... Not too far. We're still on old movies. So generally, you liked the bandwagon because yeah. you like musicals, but you like Singing in the Rain. That's that's still at the top, I, is it? I know or... it's such a cliche, but I do. I just love it. So just... bandwagon. You're not going to be persuaded no, into the bandwagon I'm side. Uh, shame. I realise <laughs> I'm in a minority being on the bandwagon side. But I just, for me... On the bandwagon with the bandwagon. On the bandwagon <laughs> with the bandwagon. But, you know, it's got Fred Astaire and already that's a huge tick. Which is completely and, fair. And do you like... Are you, are you a Fred fan? I've got... I think it's impossible to be a fan of musicals and not like Fred I, Astaire. I feel the same. Um, feel the same. But he, he is obviously... Probably the best. I think of, of his kind. I mean, I read, I heard an interview with Sid Charisse, who was obviously his leading lady in this film, and she was trying to be really tactful and because she was asked, and it was a horrible question to ask her, which of the two she preferred, having worked with both Jean Kelly mm. and Fred Astaire. I and mean, that's a horrible thing that, to be asked. Yeah. And she was trying to be really tactful and going, well, Fred was more sort of 
tap dancey and jeans <laughs> were, and you could see she was leaning more towards jean the Kelly. cogs turning of how do i phrase this diplomatically i yeah. know and I, I i felt sorry for her because it's a horrible thing to be asked but yeah. a great situation to be in though having worked with to, two to, legends, yeah. To have that choice. To Amazing. Say, oh, Gene Kelly, Fred Astaire. Well, you know, how does one choose? <laughs> I mean, for me, it's Fred all the way. Because just the charm of him, I think. And Gene Kelly, I think, is a little bit too arty sometimes for mm. me. Um, American in Paris, you've seen that. Yeah. That 20 minute ballet sequence, that, that's when I go and make a cup of tea. Yeah, it was just uh, a bit too far in some cases. It, I can understand why he would want to do that. He wants to showcase his talents which he's very good which at are prodigious yes. fair play but yeah i feel fred astaire had a much more basically i could see myself going for a pint with fred astaire and i'd go for like merlot in a <laughs> wine bar with gene kelly and you know what i'm more of a pint kind of girl yeah. so that would happen more regularly if that makes sense yeah in my it does head. <laughs> I, I, i'd be more of a martini cocktail with fred but um, <laughs> not that i drink martini cocktails all beer oh just fred's Fred's the bed. I, I, you know, you wouldn't persuade me over to the Gene Kelly side either. So um, you know. a great love of carnations in this film as well. Did you notice that? Quite a yes. large amount. I mean, I have hair fever, so I'm not usually a fan, but I appreciated them in this film. Although sometimes it was a little bit because they were wearing a tuxedo or something, and part of my little mind was like, "Oh, is it like a Godfather crossover? <laughs> like at some point it's going to be a horse's head tap dancing around." <laughs> and, oh, and I imagine because it'd be on a stage and in like a jazz sequence like that, it would be you know one of those wooden horses you get as a kid that just had the material wooden head, and he'd be like dancing with that with a carnation. That didn't happen in the bandwagon. In and case the, you haven't seen it, yeah, with the mafia wheeling in the back. Exactly. <laughs> So, yeah, that's what I kept picturing. Just <laughs> that mafia, mafia musical crossover. Yeah. Hey, there's there's a whole that's... genre we've just created a Boom, genre right done. here, right now. Copyright all, that. All we need <laughs> is the funding, <laughs> and we can make it right here. Yeah. And oh. our Kickstarter page will be in a link <laughs> to this podcast. <laughs> Please do donate. Please donate generously, <laughs> so we can exhume register. <laughs> oh dear. Um, there was another thing I noticed. That mm-hmm. I was going to mention it to you as well because I just thought is this just me or is that on purpose which is there's a bit sort of towards the beginning where he goes to Broadway and he's like it's changed and it's turned into sort of a fun fair kind of thing and then he's going around all the fun fair type games that are there and one of them is this mystery box yeah. that he can't open but then eventually he does a little cheeky dance number and then he can open it at the end and all these bells and whistles and flags come out and all of the flags they were uh, American, British, and French, basically the Allies during the Second World War. And I was like, when was this made? Was this some partially propaganda <laughs> exercise? Do you know, uh, I never noticed yeah, it's, that. Yeah, it was just American, British, I... and French. I never noticed. And I was like, why those three? And I was like, mm. oh, the Allies. Yes. <laughs> so not a German or Japanese flag. To be seen anywhere. <laughs> I never... Did you, I tell you what I did notice, which I'd never noticed before. I found a boo-boo in the film, I oh. think. Right at the end, when uh, they're in New York at the theatre, you see the marquee with the name of the theatre. Yeah. And then you see the programme. You often see the programme opening to show the progression of the numbers. And the name on the programme is different than the name oh. on the theatre. The name dun. of the... Th- the, uh, da, da. <laughs> the name on the theatre began with A, the Alnwick Theatre or something, and then the name of the theatre on the programme began with S. Was It wasn't the Schubert Theatre. But watch it. I'm going to watch it again and just, just check. But oh, they are different. <gasps> One of the great boo-boos has been <laughs> overlooked. I mean, okay, it's not up there with North by Northwest and the little kid with his fingers in oh, his ear. <laughs> <laughs> as, as Hollywood boo-boos go. But I noticed, maybe I'm the first person ever to notice that. And that film's 65 yeah. years old. That and the fact there were only four scenes in that programme as well. <laughs> as they turn the page at the end. Oh, okay. okay yes. That was a long dance number. Yes. <laughs> Yes, and, and dance numbers totally disconnected for reasons we simply don't understand. But you know what? Who needs to understand it when it's so joyous? That is that's true. The whole um, thing. For me, that's one of the things I I do love about the old musicals because my nan is possibly one of the most Yorkshire people in the history of the world. And uh, because of that, we can't really watch anything that it has any swearing in it. Just anything that could be considered any aspect mildly offensive. So it has to be true, innocent family friendly things so that's why I think I like them because I spent a lot of time with my grandparents growing up so 
it reminds me of that, which is good. So you watch them with them. Yeah. yeah. My mum's a big fan as well. But yeah, essentially, it's it's just a true innocence to the films, which I don't think you always get today. I think there's much more grittiness. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think there are a lot of stories that need to be told, and we certainly can use these as forums to make other people aware of stuff. That's completely fine. But it's sometimes just nice to have a palate cleanser of something totally innocent, silly, like we've been saying, doesn't make any sense, but is just just happy. Just uplifts the soul. Yeah. And that, for me, is what watching old movies are about. Yeah, I watch film noir as well, and they're really good. But honestly, if I'm just sitting down and I need something, I'm not going to watch a film noir. If I just need mm. something, I'm going to watch a musical or a comedy or a romance or something like, or what, or what are disparagingly known as women's pictures, <laughs> which are just thumping good romance stories. Lady cinema for ladies. <laughs> it's, it's usually two women fighting over a bloke. Let's, <laughs> let's be frank. After a misunderstanding that could have been solved in 10 After minutes. After a misunderstanding that could have been solved. Or, or and this is, this is a, a common plot, I say common, I know at least two films have got this thread, that one person is dying but doesn't tell the other person. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. so those mm-hmm. So that's a th- to me that's a thumping good story because you know I might well have a little weep and <laughs> nothing could bad. make me weep more than that kind of film other than Bandwagon there's, no, there's nothing to weep about no. although at the end I had a little sniffle at the end I hadn't done that for a, where they all gather and uh, oh, Sir right. is telling Fred how much they, they all love him and they all sing he's a jolly good fellow that, that was I felt quite emotional <laughs> but I haven't watched this film for a long time so nice to see it on the, the projector screen oh I love your projector screen I'm, I tell you what there's nothing better than if I have the house to myself coming home getting the screen up even though it's a faff to get it all up and just watching you just don't take it down <laughs> I could just do that and never have any light in what my you living could room. do yeah what you could do is you put it up but then if you want light in your living room project an image <laughs> of light and then just turn the light on <laughs> oh god why didn't I think of that possibly not the most environmentally friendly thing I grant you because you'd be having a light on all day but and the projector and the projector <laughs> but you know oh <laughs> I think swings and roundabouts. <laughs> one day, one day, I'm going to have a, a built-in screen um, there, uh, just just above the mirror there, just above the fireplace, and perhaps a projector over the wall. People have done that. I've done that. Actually, there's a brilliant film. I think it's from 1934 called The Ex Mrs. Bradford, and it's about uh, a detective and his ex-wife uh, who solve the mystery and get back together again. Fancy. You could have worked that out just from the title. <laughs> And in the film, he has his own cinema screen that rises up out of a cup. And I was like, oh, my God, it's 1934. How could he have that? And I want that. Um, you know, I used to date a guy and he had one of those beds where the TV would pop up no. from the end of the bed, which I was like, I mean, that's great. But what if it comes off and then you kick it? Because he was over six foot tall. Um. I was like, you haven't thought this through at all. He's like, it'd be fine. I'm like, mm, I think mm. it will. That's obviously why we broke up, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and now let's segue seamlessly into Louise's half-life. Um, yeah, that's another two minutes gone. <laughs> <laughs> you do yourself down, girl. Never mind. Who needs love lives? You've got old movies. Yeah, Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly. Yeah. Fred Astaire, um, if, you, if it must be. No, I, I, I do. I, I am a great admirer of Gene Kelly's. I think he's done some fantastic work. But yeah, who needs romance? Yeah. We've had a lot of fun today Louise I'm not sure we've covered the topic but we've had a lot of fun so let's wrap up The Bandwagon 1953 directed by Vincent Minnelli it is available on DVD and on various sites whatever you young people use <laughs> to watch your films are we recommending The Bandwagon <laughs> Louise, uh, it was lovely to have you. I hope we'll have you back for a return match. Maybe we'll look yes, at please. an old sci fi that you haven't seen before. That would be excellent. If I can find one. <laughs> uh, I bet I can't. But anyway, or oh, we'll just have another musical. I'm I mean, happy with that hell? as well. We'll just do the musicals. Anyway, thank you very much. So, Louise, before we go, um, you have to just tell us what you're up to comedically. Uh, can we see you anywhere? Have you got a show coming up, for uh, example? Do you know what? That's so funny you mention. <laughs> Um, so this year I'm doing a show at the Edinburgh Fringe with my comedy brother, my comedy bestie, Mr. Josh Bolf. Uh, it's called Josh and Lou Working Classy. It'll be on, and it's a great name, right? And then, Ooh. um, we will be on in Edinburgh from the 12th to the 26th 
of August at 4 p.m. at the Three Sisters. And we're going to do numerous work in progress shows as well that you can see um, best by following my Twitter and Instagram accounts, which are at Ms. Lou Atkinson. And that's that's good. That's it. You heard it here first. Go and see it here first. I shall be going to see it, if not in London, but in Edinburgh. Somewhere I will see your show. That's for sure. Thank you very much, Louise Atkinson. And um, thank you to you for listening. And I hope you all enjoy watching The Bandwagon. Thanks very much. And see you next time.